Yeah, uh, y'all, how you guys feeling? Good? Yo, it's exciting that uh, Boots is in Chicago, right? It's a good fucking look. So um, the, the next half hour or so, uh, we're going to chat, and then I think the, the hope is that we'll open it up and have a, a larger conversation and give y'all a time to ask questions and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, kind of before we get started, I know you are uh, kind of like the um, conscience of the West Coast hip hop scene, but you were born in Chicago? Yeah, I was born in Chicago. I knew I liked um, you, man. I knew, I knew that, that was. <laughs> then moved to Detroit when I was one. Then we moved to Oakland by the time I was six, so. Okay. Yeah. So the, the best oh. things from the Midwest you kind of <laughs> took with you then. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, you know, I, it, people are from Detroit. What I remember from there is the Errol Flynn. <laughs> <laughs> That's the main thing I remember. But what, so. what, what were your folks doing in Chicago? Uh, organizing. My, yeah. uh, my father and mother were organizers for uh, Progressive Labor Party. And... Um, then the party moved them to Detroit to be the full-time organizers there. Um, and uh, then there was some, some sort of split or something like that, I don't know. And they moved to the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. uh, and my father went to law school at that point. So, so I mean, and one of the things that we're going to talk about, especially at top, is how you became you, if that's fair. Um, so, you know, I just want to talk about early influences and being born into a family of activists. What were some of your earliest memories of, of politics, of movement building? Well, the, the thing that I carried away from the experience of, of my family being organizers was something that I didn't, I didn't see it as political, but it was that our house always had people in it. And there was always parties and, you know, things that later I found out were meetings, but, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there were parties, uh, there were, you know, there'd be bid whist games and, you know, all that sort of stuff going on. And so when I became an organizer, um, at the time, I, I felt like the, the landscape of organizing looked pretty uh, boring. You know, there would be, and at the time, there'd be a lot of demonstrations of five people with picket signs and, you know, a study group or whatever. And I think that that glimpse of organizing in Detroit gave me a vision that, you know, it's going to have to be more social. People are going to have to look at it as their own thing in order for people to want to be involved. So when did music, I mean, music entered the picture there, I guess, right? I mean, at par said parties, I imagine there was music. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Um, and, and I realized that that was, that was culture. There was a culture being built around that. And, you know, of course, some of what I know about it is, is uh, from asking questions later. But... I realized that it's important to have have fun and and make people understand that these ideas are about how to live life in a more comfortable way. That there's a struggle, but that struggle not only will make your life fulfilled once this inevitable revolution that may happen sometime in the future happens, but it'll make your life better right now. And that engaging with other folks is, you know, a, a better way of living. So we're, we're going to come back to that, that, that intersection of art and culture and politics and fun. Uh, mm -hmm. But, but I want to I I go back to, to music because uh, your ear, you, you produced a lot of the coup records. And so I'm curious about early influences sonically. Who... Who were you digging as a kid, or you know, who's some of the first records that you remember hearing that made you want to explore more or dig for records? Or yeah, well, I mean, Prince was probably the <laughs> first. <laughs> yeah, before I wanted to be a revolutionary, I wanted to be Prince. <laughs> and, and the revolution. <laughs> <laughs> huh. and That's good. 
and you know that that was kind of part of this uh, yearning that I you know I see it in a lot of like young kids that you know they they wish they were on TV that was me they wish they were you know performing and it comes out of this idea that you know we're not important and those are the important people some of it comes out of that idea and we see these folks that really affect us emotionally and we want to we want to be part of that we want to we want to do that too we don't want to be insignificant and um, and and I think that that later when I became an organizer I was able to get that feeling of of you know having some meaning and 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 being part of it all being part of the world and and not being passed over and I think that those things are, are, are very much connected um, many of us are told at some point either through example or or whatever that we don't have the time or we shouldn't be an artist right and I and I think that it is something inherent in humanity to create and we don't have the time we really don't we uh, many of us have to survive and spend most of our time doing that um, so when did you start making stuff um, I started out writing in high school um, what, what, what got you started literature a, or, or, or a, hip hop a teacher getting me to write stories and then uh, the play then, then the the drama club needed someone to write a version of West Side Story so I wrote a rap ver even though I didn't rap I wrote a rap version of uh, West Side Story that was based in Oakland called East Side Story and, <laughs> And um, actually, the, uh, the woman, now woman, who worked on it with me ended up being in uh, Heaven and Earth, being the star of that movie, hmm. um, Hip. Um, you don't remember any of the verses from no, the East Side uh -uh. Story. But because people didn't boo it, I was like, oh. <laughs> that was encouraging. Maybe I can, I can do this, you know? But you, so you wrote it in raps, but you weren't, you weren't rhyming at the time. No, I, I mean, everybody was. Like, yeah. it was something that you just did around, and it wasn't, it, wasn't, it, was, it wasn't even a competition for us in the sense that none of us really thought. There were a couple people that we thought were really good, and one was my friend Johnny, and, you know, um, but, but if you weren't one of those couple people, you just rap. And it was just, you beat on tables at lunchtime, and... It was just something everybody did. But, but this is in the emergence of that moment, right? I mean, prior to your teenage years, hip hop wasn't prevalent because it didn't exist, right? I mean, so, I mean in the sense that it gets to the Bay Area come what, late well, 70s, well, early 80s at the earliest. Well, okay, here's the thing. I, I don't subscribe to the, hip, the, the common hip hop narrative that hip hop started because somebody put the peanut butter and the chocolate in the Bronx somewhere on one particular night. <laughs> Didn't happen that way. No peanut when butter hip, in the Bronx. When hip hop came in its form that it is right now, you know, black people didn't say, wow, what is this new thing? It's ingenious, you know? It was something that was already part of the culture. So it, 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 it did, and, and I think that that history that is, that is taught in that way is it happened from these particular instances is one that takes uh, hip hop and tries to separate it from the black experience. And by doing so, it looks at it in a vacuum that is separate from uh, the history of black people, which is a history of struggle. And so that's, I, I, to prove my point, um, when I lived in Detroit, my older brother and his friends, they would all do hand bone. Right? And I can't do it, but beat on the chest and on the leg and slap, and they'd rap against each other. This was in the mid 70s in, in Detroit. Nobody was calling it hip hop or anything like that, but it was something that was done. 
Um, and I hear people from Newark talking about that uh, in the 70s maybe that there were all these mattresses around and it was a big thing to flip our mattresses to music. Um, and that's why, like you hear in Lauren Hill's thing, she says flipping in the ghetto on a dirty mattress. It was like, a, a, it became an art form and a sport. However, it didn't happen in other places and it wasn't included in hip hop. Neither was ham boning. But when I moved to Oakland and the first time I heard Sugar Hill Gang, there was somebody else from the Midwest or the South and we both said, they're playing a ham bone song on the radio. <laughs> So, hip hop was, you know, it wasn't new. And th there's a collection of, uh, there's a recorded collection of songs from prisons from the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s called Get Your Ass in the Water and Swim Like Me. And they're rapping on that. Uh, in 1963, uh, there was a top 10 song on the radio called Here Come the Judge by Pig, Pig Meat Markham. Listen to it. Yeah. Sounds. More like a Sugar Hill record than Sugar Hill records did. Yeah, and Langston Hughes was rhyming over blues, and I mean, yeah, the, yeah there's a long, yeah. long tradition. And and so anyway, I I think that it, I don't know. And also, when you're a kid, three years is a long time. So, you know, this is by this time we're talking about the late '80s. So if somebody told us that hip hop was new, you know, we wouldn't have thought that. But you, but you started rhyming in high school? Yeah, or yeah. Or prior to that point? Yeah, I mean, just for fun, yeah. Yeah, and then and when, when did you start to take it more seriously as a craft? Well, there's a particular, exp and, and, and I come from an organization that was pretty sectarian and, and not, didn't look at culture in the way that, let's say, I look at it now, and maybe even that organization looks at it now. Um, and it wasn't, culture that was created by capitalism was not looked at as something that could be used for revolutionary purposes. However, um, one, I didn't care, because I like <laughs> music, uh, you know, I'm gonna like what I like. And two, I was also looking for ways to put these ideas out in, in large ways. And at, there was a, a thing that happened we were um, canvassing this one area of San Francisco called Double Rock, and we do that every week. Um, and there were, there were a few struggles going on there that we were involved in. Um, but something happened in between the two, uh, the, the two weekly visits that we made. And, and this was very important in uh, my realization of, of what, what could happen with hip hop. A woman named Rossi Hawkins and her two twin sons that were eight years old got beat down bloody by the police in Double Rock Projects in San Francisco. Um, the neighborhood immediately came out, hundreds of people, and surrounded the police. Um, what had happened a week or two before was a guy had gotten beaten up by the police and then taken in the police car and driven around until he died and they didn't because they didn't take him to the hospital. Um, so people wanted to get Rossi and her kids away from the police and take her to the hospital and because um, they feared for her life. So they g surrounded the police and the police got scared and started shooting up in the air. And if you've ever been around a gun going off, you know that whatever you were thinking a second before is not what you're thinking then. You're thinking, let me get the fuck out of here. And everybody ran away. But at a certain point, everybody turned around. They turned around and came back, got Rossi and her kids away from the police, and sent those police out without their car. And the car was turned over. So two things, one, none of this was put in any mainstream newspapers or anything like that the next day. Um, but what I've told you so far is what 
like dozens of people told, and other folks, you know, um, added other things, but these, this is what everyone agreed on happened, everything that I've told you so far. And the other thing that happened is that what made everyone turn around was, that, was this. It was the summer of 1989, and the number one song on the radio was Fight the Power by Public Enemy. And somebody started chanting, fight the power, fight the power, fight the power. Mm -hmm. And everyone said that then is when they knew that they all had a job to do. And when, when that story was being told to me that day is when I realized the power that music could have, that, that uh, hip hop could be a rallying cry that Consolidates, uh, consolidates our ideas into action. And, and you, you've, of course, over the course of your career, you've used it as a rallying cry in, in, in many instances. A couple years after that, that moment, right, 91 is the, the, kill, the kill My Landlord record comes out? Uh, no, we put out an EP in 91, just locally, and uh, 93 is when Kill My Landlord came out. Okay, and then when, when does Gen Genocide and Juice come out? Uh, 94, 95. You guys know that record, Genocide and Juice? Right. Genocide and Juice, to me, seems like such an important album because it's also a commentary on, uh, you know, what mainstream media, mainstream radio was also pushing. I remember when it dropped, and it was so refreshing to see and to hear that record. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, when, when did you know that you were beginning to act as, uh, you know, this, this person who's Comment, you know, making this grand uh, commentary on culture, and people were listening. Well, well I, di I didn't look at it as uh, critiquing the mainstream uh, music that was out at the time. It, you know, and a lot of people make that assumption because it's called Genocide and Juice, and Snoop had a song called Gin and Juice, but Gin and Juice was a popular drink in the Bay Area way before that song. And actually, he did that song because Spice One, who's from the Bay Area, always talked about gin and juice. Mm. And that was, it was just like part of popular culture. And so um, the idea was that the album was a concoction. And uh, you know, we were talking about the genocide that's going on under capitalism and as well as giving you some music, which is the juice part of it. But um, the, uh, what was the other part of your question? Well, I mean, but that is an interesting, that's kind of where you live, right? I mean, you, you referred to it in the beginning as, as being someone who's giving you this, this understanding and making it funky always, right? That's like, I mean, that's the signature, it seems, of some of the music, some of the records that you put out is that it's, Conscience, uh, it's conscious and it makes you move. It's music that you could not only nod your head to, but dance to on some yeah. funky, funky. Well, and, and, and for me, I, I feel like that aspect of it, you know, when you hear music that just, that you can't just only put into an intellectual box that makes you move your body. You know, it's funny, my, my daughter was listening to uh, Candy when she was like, Three years by a cameo, and um, she was like, "Daddy, th this music is making me dance, even if I, even though I don't want to, you know." <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you know, there's there's something about that that the, that making music that touches you in that way and combining it with with uh, lyrics that encourage you to uh, to move your body in on the long term in a certain yeah. way. Yeah, move um, me. Yeah, and you know, and and that's just been something that I like to combine. I, I never was particularly a, a you know. It also has to do with a, with an outlook. A lot of folks that entered into the arena of trying to talk about world affairs or you know, even local politics or whatever w was happening, came at it from a standpoint of 
doom and gloom, like everything's fucked up, you know, and you know, you should get angry. And it's all, you know, and, and, and it kind of left people, even, even visual art was like that a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd see like a lot of murals that were the most radical in their analysis to a certain extent, um, but they were, were dark and gloomy and there was, there was no vision of what could happen. And I think that for me, you know, the slow head nodding beats uh, uh, w didn't do it for me. You know, it didn't it didn't allow for that hopefulness. And uh, yeah, and and, think, and, yeah. and it comes with an analysis that things will change once there's a mass movement that gets rid of this system, right? Not just that there's. You know, and, and, and so I think that a lot of music came to the doom and gloom uh, aesthetic because there was no movement giving that other analysis. There was a yearning for things to be different. But, uh, you know. Uh, and you, you brought the party to, to the streets, literally, right? I mean, you, you were doing concerts on a truck bed. Uh, yeah, this is around later. The, yeah. Later, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, but as a as a way to organize, as a way to make a, a party, right? You brought. I mean, if you talk a little about that, because that that seems like an incredibly compelling tactic and way to bring not only the message to the people, but literally the party. Well, um, I I was uh, doing a workshop at La Pena Cultural Center in uh, in which is actually I think technically in Berkeley, but. Um, this was at the time of the Prop 21, uh, the, the campaign against Prop 21, which was a uh, proposition that, among other things, would allow 14-year-olds to be sentenced to prison as adults and also uh, made a gang uh, be able to be three people wearing similar clothing. And uh, so we, d we did a campaign against this. It, the workshop it was an art and organizing workshop. And so what we did was we got a whole bunch of people together and uh, had everybody write about this and we put out a, a, a cassette that was a free cassette that was like a newspaper on tape e talking about this issue. And we uh, got on a flatbed truck and went around to neighborhoods and did concerts and gave out the, the cassettes. And it was more of an experiment to see how to use hip hop and organizing. Um, at that time, though, what, what kind of also happened was a lot of like nonprofits picked up on the idea of, as they should have, of using hip hop um, to organize folks. Um, but, and, and I think that I ended up, like a lot of times I'd get a, call like, hey, you want to come to New York or wherever, Chicago or wherever and have a meeting with so-and-so and, you know, a round table with these other artists and talk about music and politics. And I do that, then I find out like somebody slapped my face on the front of a brochure and getting a lot of foundation grants for the idea of, you know, using hip hop for organizing, but with, the radical politics taken out of it, yeah. right? Um, and um, so, and and so, like a lot of what kind of got pushed, which was a good answer to. Let me say this: that my experience in the '80s and early '90s was that um, music and culture were not being used enough in uh, movements that. Mm -hmm. You know, it was kind of like a boring setup, and and people didn't want to be involved. With respect to to uh, maybe a couple exceptions, but um, and I think that I think now we've definitely we got music and other culture involved in it, and got that handled. And so, but that answer 
was very necessary, uh, that, that development where people were seeing that, you know, this is a very important intersection right here and we have to use that was necessary. But it became almost how, you know, how in other things we were talking about the tactic leading the strategy. So you have whole organizations which were built around uh, using hip hop to organize kids, but without any political idea of how to transform what was around them. Um, so, you know, a lot of folks, you know, did a good thing, like by making programs that had gave kids access to studio equipment and things like that, but didn't have any other program for them to be involved in that that could change their world around them. Yeah. You also use, uh, I mean, not only fun and, and funk, but also humor seems to be an important part of the work that you do as an artist. Um, the uh, five million ways to kill a CEO joint, for instance, it's pretty fucking funny. Um, so how, how, does, how does that find its way into your work and, wh and what is the importance of, you know, because I, 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 I would imagine that is also an important aspect of, to bring, bring that to the organizing work as well. Well, um, I, I think there's a couple of things is that some of the first organizers I was around were like old school union folks and old school CP folks from the 50s. And they had some experience in organizing their peers. And, because, and they had some success at that. And they were always the funny dudes. They were always the people that could engage in a conversation, see the irony in what was being talked about, point that out, and it'd be funny. They also were often, you know, like one guy that I came up around was this old English dude that had organized, done union work in, in uh, England, and he was always like, well, if you can't share a pint with, a, with, with somebody, how are you gonna expect them to go on strike with you, right? <laughs> and so. Yeah, human shit. I know, so, so I always made the connection that it's really about it's not just about you giving someone some facts and figures. It's about people relating to you as a human being, and then they can relate to your thought processes, right? And, and so that's some of it, but it, it, I think it's, it, it wasn't as thought out as that. Like, I, what I always thought of as, when, when I used to think of myself as more of those, one of those lyricists, writers, whatever, which I, I actually try to get away from, but it's kind of like um, the lines that we thought were witty and cool were, were, were based on some sort of irony that was humorous. Um, so a lot of- Not everyone know, thought it was funny, right? Yeah, you, yeah. You, you've had, um, you know, various right-wing pundits oh, yeah. comment on the- uh, inappropriate nature of that. So they thought they like, took the shit literally or something. Yeah, well, well they don't have I, a I don't think they were that dumb, but they just, they didn't. They might like, be, by the way, they might be yeah. that dumb, but. Yeah, um, there's a columnist for, that's also part of Fox that was saying it's, uh, it's what, right wing anti, -amer oh, sorry, left radical anti-Americanism um, disguised as highbrow intellectualism, and so uh, it's not a decent. It's a decent quote, yeah. actually. It's not actually, I kinda, it's kinda I put it blurb. on the top of my bio. So, yeah. And, <laughs> nice. So, and, <laughs> but but so the the humor kind of worked its way in natural, and it wasn't until I had already made steal this album that a friend of mine was listening to it. And they were like, "Oh, you know, humor. That's kind of your thing." And I was like, "Really? I didn't." You know, like it's it's just kind of what I thought hip hop was. So, yeah, that's funny. Um, and uh, uh, I want to fast forward a little bit just because I, I also want to get to people's questions. But um, you know, recently, uh, of course, you've been 
heavily involved uh, as a participant and organizer in Occupy Oakland. So, of course, you know, we're in Chicago and there's a, a strong Occupy movement here, but if you could talk about the condition and, and what, what the, you know, what it looks like on the ground in, in, in Oakland. Um, well, people have been talking about it through this whole conference, but what, what I look at the Occupy movement as and what uh, Occupy Oakland is more what I know about, but it's just the idea that the left can work together. And that's all it is. So when people are like, oh, I don't want to be in that, I'm like, okay, so you don't think that we need a broad-based movement because this is the one that's here right now. We're not going to get a new population of people in the next <laughs> 60 years. So, you know, if you opt out of this, you're opting out of the idea that the left can work together. That doesn't discredit any of the problems that, are, that exist in it. That doesn't, you know, so um, I think that in Occupy Oakland, we were able to see people sitting in a space together that at other, before that wanted to kill each other or would n never have been in the same meeting together. And uh, you also, obviously, the big strength was people that had never been involved before because before that, the movement, in quotes, was invisible to them. Mm -hmm. They didn't, you know, one of the, uh, one of the worst compliments that I've ever that I ever get on my music, and I used to get it more, was that people would see me on the street and be like, hey man, oh, I love your shit, man, but you know, I gotta listen to that real shit, <laughs> right? And what they mean by that, what they meant in these particular folks was stuff that, music that talked about them surviving, music that talked about them being able to hustle. So the music that talk to, talks about selling dope, there's a movement behind it and there's some reality to it. Like you can sell a rock and make $10. I don't know what the going price is now, but you can make some money. <laughs> and that's, that music is connected to a material movement. For the longest time I've been making music that People may listen to it and read about it, but it's pie in the sky. They look around, there's no movement around them, right? And it's, so it's definitely, it was definitely a th theory. It wasn't connected to what we want a movement to be connected to is that we, that, that we want it to be connected to material things because we're talking about material change. We're not just talking about a sense of pride or a sense of, control, we're talking about how wealth is distributed. And up until recently, I don't think that that was communicated very well. One, because of small numbers, but two, because um, I, I believe that, that many folks got in, get involved in, in campaigns and are afraid to make the connections between you know capitalism and actual the struggle to get paid more and this and the movement we talk about a lot of things that are that are pretty abstract and we don't talk about people putting food on the table people you know um, people being able to pay their their light bill or whatever and the folks that do talk about that are also not talking about changing the system. And, and I'm being very general, obviously there's a lot of good exceptions to this. But I think that for the most part, people weren't able to see a movement that did that. Folks were starting to see it with uh, Occupy Wall Street movement. Um, and so what one of the problems that's happened is a lot of the same old left sectarianism, you know, and it doesn't, I wish it was only political because all of these questions that come up are good questions, they're good debates. I don't even, I don't think that, I even would say that I don't even think that the question, there are any of the questions that are divisive. I think what's divisive is that many of us 
fall into that same old cliquish nastiness. Um, and people stop coming around, not because of a difference in ideas, they come around because people are talking shit behind each other's back and they don't want to see that person again. And we haven't come up with an ethical way of dealing with criticism and self-criticism. We haven't come up with you know, any set of standards around that. And so rumors abound and things like that. And this is at least what was happening with Occupy Oakland. Mm -hmm. That being said, there's a lot of stuff still going on with Occupy Oakland. Um, and one of them is this Lakeview sit-in. Um, And, and that's been going on for a couple weeks now. And they've got a summer school happening in the daytime and people uh, occupying it at night. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Another thing is the uh, Occupy Oakland foreclo excuse me, foreclosure defense group that has been extremely successful in every campaign that they've taken on. Um, and they they've just entered into a new coalition with uh, ACE and uh, Causa Justa, Just Cause, and uh, East Bay Solidarity, and they are all uh, making neighborhood assemblies, which will, which will then uh, declare, hopefully you'll get to this point soon, declare moratoriums on, uh, on foreclosures. Uh, <laughs> Because what we've seen with Occupy Oakland uh, and foreclosure defense is that the police don't want too much media around that. It's too much good publicity for us. So often they won't even come out. Hmm. Be and so it's a, you know we've got them at a point where this is a this is an area that we can grow a lot in. Uh, cool. And you know there's there's a. Uh, uh, we just started this fast food workers union that's getting a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, good feedback and we've got some folks salting and basically getting jobs just to organize the fast food workers union. Um, normally in the past, it's been hard, harder to organize fast food uh, workers unions, but one thing that Occupy Oakland has going for it is that the owners of these franchises uh, do believe that we can shut them down if they fire somebody for uh, organizing a union. So that's something with a lot of uh, promise to it. There's also the Occupy uh, AC Transit, which has been working with drivers and riders uh, to, right now they've just extended the, the uh, transfers, extended the, the, the use of the transfers, and they're hoping to uh, have some driver initiated free fair days soon. So and there's and there's an Occupy Oakland conference that's be coming up soon in July, I believe. So that's uh that's yeah. great. So I, this will be my last question, and then we'll open it for, for questions. Uh, I know, you know we just heard that Haymarket is uh, putting out a book of yours, your lyrics. Uh, <laughs> we are the ones, lyrics and other stuff. Um, tentative title, but uh, if you could talk a little about that project and, and other, other projects you're working on as an artist right now, too. Well, actually, a lot of times when I'm writing my lyrics, uh, I'll real, I realize that um, my lyrics may be seen before they're heard. And so it definitely influences my writing. It, you know, I like what certain words look like more than other words. Or I like how, you know, this sort of break in the line fits and, you know, there definitely have been choices that I've made because of that. Um, and, and so, you know, I've always wanted to, to, I've always wanted to put out my lyrics in a printed way. So, uh, we're doing that with Haymarket and there's stories about you know, how certain songs came to be and the making of certain songs and, um, you know, just talking about the same kind of stuff I'm talking about right now. <laughs>